So, without any further ado, let us begin. Welcome, all of my lovely viewers, both live, who you see on the chat here, and in the future, who will be watching this section in a bread tube essay like style on YouTube in the future. Thank you for being here. Please consider subscribing to my channel. And I hope that you will enjoy as we dive in to learning the, or to a telling of the oral history of uh, the criminalization of queerness, of gender nonconformity, and of homosexuality in America, and the history of Stonewall, one of the most pivotal historical events in American queer history. Very, very happy to have you all here today. Um, and I would like to open this first off with a request, which is if you are moved by this story that you're about to hear, if you find it interesting, please consider sharing this video or many of the other videos like this video with people you know who this could be valuable to. I promise you, we have lost so much queer history in America for a number of reasons um, that we won't talk about immediately. And it is important that as many people as possible learn this. Even if they're just passingly familiar with the events of the past, that can prevent them from, th from repeating the mistakes that led to some of these horrific events that we are about to talk about, okay? This uh, section is going to be a little intense at some points. We're not going to talk about anything particularly graphic, but we will be talking about oppression, persecution, and mistreatment. So just be aware of that, okay? Thank you. First of all, let us start with a discussion of legality, indecency, and prohibition. Many of you know what the prohibition was. The prohibition was a period of American history in which uh, alcohol was banned. Um, and interestingly, um, alcohol, people like alcohol, as it turns out. People really, really, really like alcohol. And people also really like being gay. And both of those things being illegal at the same time led to a number of clandestine clubs sometimes referred to as speakeasies. Speakeasies, nightclubs, they had many different names, were uh, often run by criminal organizations, um, which could essentially provide a counter uh, to the government. And these, uh, these speakeasies and nightclubs, because they were already operating in um, the illicit trade of alcohol, often um, would also end up being a community or a space with uh, for, for people who didn't fit the norm, aka gender non-conforming people, uh, gay people, trans people. And we're going to talk about that a bit. But before we fully get into the discussion about the prohibition, I want to talk about the history of legality in America. And this month, you know, every single Pride Month, there is always a lot of discourse to go around. There's a lot of disagreement and, and uh, you know, and conversations and, and things like that. One such that we see every single year is the inevitable kink at Pride discourse. Um, and I think that that, that that is a interesting and enlightening topic. Um, once you start to understand how how the structure of uh, of of criminalizing homosexuality and queer relationships and queer expression has has unfolded in the past. So, I'm sure many of you know this, but America started as a colony, um, and uh, of of uh, England, and there was of course other colonies in the general area, uh, French colonies, Spanish colonies, etc., etc. But the original 13 colonies were the property of the British crown. And as a result, the colonies at first adopted the same laws that held for the British crown. 
For those of you who don't know, the uh, English Empire was not particularly friendly to gay people. Um, in fact, at the time, um, gay people, uh, being gay, engaging in homosexuality was a capital crime. You could be sentenced to death, and people were. Um, and when the colonies formed, that remained the same. Now, unfortunately, I wish that I could tell you, um, I wish that I could tell you that the colonists said, fuck that, we're America, we believe in freedom. We're not going to keep that stuff when, uh, when the American Revolution happened. But unfortunately, that is not what happened. Um, throughout uh, the colonial and pre-colonial periods of America, numerous colonies adopted their own laws um, about, uh, about how they would go about criminalizing homosexuality and queerness. Um, something that I found uh, in my studies is a very interesting story. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. This is just a real quick little, little anecdote from history. This occurred uh, in the late uh, 1600s, if I'm not mistaken. And I apologize for small in, uh, misdates or whatever. Uh, again, this is an oral history. It's not meant to be 100% uh, by every single date. Um, but there was once an individual by the name of Thomasine or Thomas Hall. This was a person who lived in Virginia who was arrested for uh, wearing articles of clothing belonging to the opposite sex. Um, upon their arrest and their trial in court, they were invasively investigated, and I would argue sexually assaulted by the local authorities. And it was ruled that they were both male and female. And as a result, they were sentenced by the courts to wearing at all times partially female and partially male clothing this of course made them the target of an incredible amount of hatred and also uh the target of public mockery yes oh yes that actually happened um now keep in mind at the time that was considered a light sentence because technically most of the colonies had laws that allowed you to either be castrated or killed for the act of homosexuality, which often included because of the conflation of homosexuality with things like gender nonconformance and transsexuality. Um, that often included things like cross-dressing. And in fact, as time went on into the 1700s and then into the 1800s, um, there were all kinds of, of changes to this law, but the laws remained nonetheless. In the 1800s, the law in America, in many, many states, was modified to specifically target cross-dressing. Nobody knows, like a fay. Nobody knows for sure. So, yeah, cross-dressing was literally made illegal in many places all across the U.S. throughout the 1800s. And that's not that long ago. Can you imagine? I mean, in fact, it, it's really funny. There were laws that stated things like it was illegal to wear more than three pieces of, clo of, of gender inappropriate clothing. Can you imagine going outside with a ring and a necklace on and maybe a shirt that was like, pink and and then that literally being considered illegal that you have violated because you are wearing three pieces of clothing in public that are uh are gender inappropriate wild isn't it and it's very hard to determine right because we've there's no objective women's clothing there's no objective males clothing so it's interesting how this type of law can be used to basically target anybody who is deemed too queer, too weird, too deviant. And this is something we're going to be talking about a lot, is this, uh, this, this constant obsession over deviance, this, this persecution of simple deviance, not harming anybody, 
but deviance. And the equation and the equation of deviance with uh, aggressive sex acts like rape, um, like child molestation, like pedophilia. And of, and of course, yes, uh, chat, of course, is bringing up that, yes, at, at various times in history, high heels were considered men's clothing. But we recognize that there is such a level of uh, subjectivity to these things that these laws are, are nonsensical. And of course, there are all kinds of parallels now, right? We see attempts to control people's clothing all over the place modesty laws people advocating for modesty um people saying that if you express yourself in a certain way you're inherently sexualizing people there's all kinds of things like this um of course oh yeah wigs yep there's another example yeah that's another great example um and uh yeah as an excuse for churches to suppress people that's another way of considering it as well but unfortunately the sort of legality of queer uh, expression and the uh, legality of homosexual relationships has, it remains complicated to this day. I know that some of you who are watching now live will be familiar with the fact that just the other day I talked about a law that was upheld in Pennsylvania by the Republican state legislature that maintains an obscenity law that explicitly states that according to the charter uh, or uh, sorry according to the criminal code of pennsylvania the state of pennsylvania being gay at all is considered obscene and if you sell a comic you're it's technically illegal to sell a comic that depicts a gay relationship it is technically illegal to play a cartoon in public that depicts a gay relationship. Your Adventure Time, you can't watch that, technically. Now, you might go, well, is that even being enforced? Well, it doesn't have to be enforced in order to be bad. This sta states a societal precedent for how we view queer people and how we treat gay and queer people, such as myself, as less than. And I'll remind you, all it takes is one bad individual to start enforcing that law. And there is nothing in the law that can stop them. Nothing. Except for perhaps some sort of Supreme Court case, which would be incredibly expensive and very, very painful for the person involved. I want you to take a second and just do a mental exercise with me. Can you imagine if... You kiss the person you love, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever it is. You could be straight. You don't have to be gay to imagine this. And that puts you, and that got you arrested. And the only path to recourse was to devote all of your time and money, your entire life, to fighting in the court system so that you don't go to prison for kissing the person that you love. That is really, really hard to think about. But not only was that a reality for the, for the majority of American history, it is a technical possibility right now. Right now in America, in 2021, as of the creation of this video. A lot of people rightfully celebrated the legalization of gay marriage in America. But unfortunately, the legalization of gay marriage in America didn't actually fix everything. Not even close. It didn't even begin to fix it. And we have a long way to go. And in order to see where we need to go, we have to pay attention to this sort of stuff. Bone Drude Best Dad from YouTube chat brings up, according to Texas law, in school, you were legally required to treat homosexual conduct as unacceptable and a criminal offense, according to Texas Code 85007. That does not surprise me. There are many states that still outlaw sodomy. Did you know that right now in America, 
there are multiple states that outlaw the sale of sex toys. Yeah, sex toys, as in a vibrator. You cannot buy legally a vibrator for the purposes of sexual use in multiple United States states. Yeah. In fact, you will discover that there are some states that do sell vibrators, but they are not sold for sexual purposes. They are sold specifically in pharmacies as a massage tool. That's where the massage wand came from. Correct. That's why when people talk about the Hitachi and you might look at Hitachi's public statements and they go, this is not for sexual use. This is not, they have to do that because otherwise they can't sell it. That's why the Hitachi magic wand, a sex, a, a, an effective sex toy is sold as a massager, a personal massager. No, they're not being coy. They have to do that for legal reasons. Gay Fesh says, my grandma once ordered a bunch of back massagers for the pharmacy she and her husband ran, not realizing that they were dildos. Yep, correct. That's also, yes, correct. Also, Ada Stardust brings up, that's why so many vibrators are labeled as for novelty use only. Correct. That is correct. So as you can see, this is not a problem that has disappeared. This is something that is still going on now and could very, very, very easily snap back to a much worse time. And the thing is, this is not the first time in history that we have had uh, severe resurgences in homophobia. And we are having a resurgence in not just homophobia, but in transphobia. Obviously, trans people are a bit in the, in the spotlight right now. That is the, the focus here in the year of 2021 when this video is being made. The focus tends to be centered on trans people. But they haven't forgotten, you know, the... The people who don't like trans people, they also don't like gay people. They're not okay with gay people either. And it only takes a few steps for these laws to start being enforced again. And by the way, one other interesting, one other little interesting bit, which is that under many sodomy laws, oral sex between straight couples is considered sodomy. Yeah, I bet you didn't think that would that would affect you, would it? But there it is. Now, I think we're I think we can all admit that we're a long way away from anybody policing that. People don't tend to care when straight couples do oral sex, and there's not many straight couples who've been charged under sodomy laws, but they could be. If we ever if there was a uh, if there was ever a a handmaid's tale style world, these are the type of laws that would be used. These laws are already in place. Many of the Republican parties here in the United States are currently against gay marriage. <sighs> Let me talk about some of the other things that have been banned in the history of the United States. Um, and the, some of the things that were used as evidence for arrests. Did you know that at various points in history, literally all the way up into the mid-1900s, we're talking the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, these, some of these things were still enforced. For example, did you know that a, a man offering to buy another man a drink could be cited to prove homosexual intent and therefore indecency and therefore justify an arrest by the police? Did you know that? I bet you didn't know that. Did you know that same-sex kissing for much of the 1900s was banned even in private and is still technically banned in public? In many places, um, as we discussed, there were, ban there were bans of gender-inappropriate clothing. Oh, you can crack a cold one with the guys, but don't you dare offer to buy one of your guys a drink. Don't you dare do that. Uh-uh. And the interesting thing about this is that by using a uh, morally charged angle to all of this, which I mean is frequent with the law, but not always. I mean, you know, I don't think that we, in our society, we don't really morally judge somebody for going five miles an hour over the speed limit. We don't really judge people particularly hard for, you know, I don't know doing minor, you know, minor harmless crimes. We don't really morally judge them. But by using things like indecency, deviancy, 
uh, a perversion, um, ties to pedophilia. A moral angle has been enforced and created all across the United States for most of the history. And the result of this is that even if you are not convicted of a crime, when you're arrested and your name is put out publicly in the arrest records, in the newspaper, everybody would know that you were a homosexual, that you were a queer. And as a result, tons and tons and tons of people who were essentially minding their own business were arrested and then pub publicly sh shamed, fired from their jobs, ostracized from their families, cut out of being able to act uh, being able to engage in business and unable and and losing friends. Like this was a common thing. You get arrested, your name is published in the newspaper and it's published um under violation of obscenity laws, under public perversion, under all these sort of things, you become labeled just for being gay as a sexual predator. That is kind of fucked, isn't it? And I really want to bring attention to this and spend a lot of time on this and, and wax lyrical on it a little bit because, you know, <sighs> there seems to be a lot of discussion in America, especially right now, especially this year, about, oh, well, it's not technically legal to be, you know, illegal to be gay anymore because there aren't any laws that say uh, you will die if you are found to be gay. But I, I, I want to remind you that we just literally recently, I mean— it just got undone this year, within the last few months, a ban on trans people serving in the military was, was undone, which was done by executive order. So we are not, this is not, this, this history is still here with us right now. The idea that it is okay because of how you express yourself, you know, with your gender or how you decide to take care of your body or who you decide to love to lose your job to be shamed from society. And in America, a capitalist country, losing your job is so close to death. It is so close to homelessness. And we see these statistics reflect reflected now. And I think it's important to point out and bring special attention to the way that obscenity, indecency, perversion, accusations of pedophilia, accusations of of degeneracy are used not just legally but also socially to try and control shame ostracize and isolate queer people this is something we've talked about on this channel a lot and we will inevitably of course probably be talking about it for the rest of my goddamn life So let me talk about the prohibition because um, I want to I want to touch on the prohibition a little bit. And then we're going to talk about some specific laws that happened within the last century, you know, within the last 100 years. So during the prohibition, of course, um, you know, out the sale of alcohol was banned and all kinds of black markets popped up for this. Not only because like a lot of people were like unironically addicted to to alcohol. Uh, just as they are today, but even more so um, in at the turn of the century and at the early 1900s. But um, also because people just like alcohol. People like being able to live a life where they can indulge in some earthly pleasures. Earthly pleasures are good. We like them. We like comfortable blankets. We like alcohol. We like weed. We like things that make us feel good. And taken in moderation, that's great. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we like video games. We like all kinds of things. And as a result, there was a huge black market. And this is where the mafia comes in. The mafia. Yeah, that's right. You know the mafia. The 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 Italian uh, mob. The families of New York. You know, the godfather. You know, that stuff. Well, the mafia realized they could make a lot of money selling alcohol illegally. 
and they had the manpower to check the power of the police. And they also found out that there were a lot of gay people, a lot of gay people. And if they said, hey, wait a minute, maybe we're, since we're selling this illegal alcohol anyway, maybe we can just let the gay people be gay. Maybe, maybe they'll, oh, oh, look, we let the gay people be gay in our bars. And all of a sudden we got a lot of gay people here buying our cigarettes and buying our, our alcohol. We're making bank. And so they did. And they kept doing that. And during the prohibition, these, the, 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 the tension between the mafia and the police and therefore gay people and the police was unbelievable. I'm talking that like raids were common. If there was a, a, a known gay nightclub and they were known, there were many of them. They were known. Um, the police would aim to try and catch patrons in the act. So they would wait until people were dancing, until people were drinking, until people were buying each other drinks and asking each other on to dates. And then they would raid the bars. They would go in and they would arrest patrons who are in the act of doing one thing or another. Sometimes something as little as buying a drink, like we mentioned before, other times for slow dancing. And you're going to hear the mention of slow dancing a lot. It's very odd almost like how much this comes up in the history, but there was an obsession in America with the idea of uh, slow dancing being like very bad. Like, you know, you're only supposed to slow dance if you're like with the person you're going to marry. And it was literally in many places, it was literally banned to have uh, slow dancing allowed on your premises. You could not allow it. You had to have a premises that would not would explicitly say, sorry, we don't allow slow dancing. Like, you're not allowed to. And even more so, uh, there was rules put into place that banned slow dancing of gay people entirely. So, like, if there were gay people slow dancing, that was considered an act of public indecency, even if it was on private property. Which is, like, hard for us to imagine these days. Yeah. And so during the prohibition, there were all kinds of these, these ballrooms and speakeasies, tea rooms, etc., cetera, um, that, that sprung up, largely serving queer clientele. One of these was called the Stonewall Inn. It was in Greenwich Village in New York. Sounds, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like an interesting name, right? And at the time, during the Prohibition, Stonewall, the Stonewall Inn, was a small tea room that, that, uh, that secretly sold alcoholic beverages under the table. And as a result, a lot of gay people would go there to meet other gay people, to get drunk, and to enjoy themselves. And of course, they were raided all the time. And of course, there was mafia involvement. But finally... The prohibition ended. And when the prohibition ended, the Stonewall Inn became a everyday, totally unremarkable, heterosexual bar and restaurant. And we'll come back to that. Because the story of the, of the Stonewall Inn is not yet over. <laughs> it's not yet over, okay? So let's talk real quick about... The 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s. Because this time was a very bad stretch of history for queer people in America. Um, not only were there all, there was there all kinds of moral paranoia um, during these times, but there was a severe uh, cultural reaction. There was, uh, I mean, Jesus, we had, we had, like there's so much. I mean, we had there was there was labor tensions. It was a a very tumultuous set of decades for the, for America, and it got really bad under particularly Truman and Eisenhower. Um, for example, uh, 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 President Truman created a thing called a loyalty security program, which was specifically designed to find LGBT people. Who are in positions of government and remove them from those positions in government because they had questionable loyalty to the United States. Yikes. 
uh, during this time, there were or executive orders passed on immigration that had restrictions for psychopathic personality and crimes of moral ter turpitude, which at the time, what homosexuality and gender nonconformance was considered that. There are stories all throughout history of queer people being locked in insane asylums and prisons because of psychopathic sexual, uh, sexual, uh, sexual issues or sexual psychopathy. And interestingly, in 1953, sexual perversion was formally introduced via an executive order from Eisenhower as grounds of dismissal from the federal government. During Eisenhower's time as president, approximately somewhere in the ballpark of 5,000 employees were fired on the grounds of sexual perversion. Yeah. Wild, isn't it? 5,000 government employees who were fired for sexual perversion, meaning they were gay. A lot of gay people. And um, it, it, it goes up from here. Uh, it, throughout, in fact, it is, I, I have gotten figures here that throughout the decades of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, so across that 30-year period, that three-decade period of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the estimates for arrests uh, for arrests based on uh, violations of anti-LGBTQ laws land around 300,000. 300,000 people arrested for violating anti-LGBTQ laws between the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Our par many of our parents were alive during that period. Our grandparents were in their prime during that period. 300,000 people arrested in America for that. And in fact, by 1961, 29 states and Washington, D.C., a majority of states in the United States, including Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, had passed laws specifically targeting sexual psychopaths which, of course, being gay was considered being a sexual psychopath. And these laws, get this, these laws carried punishments of indefinite detention in prison or mental facilities, regardless of your otherwise mental or physical or moral well-being. Just for being gay, you could be locked indefinitely in an insane asylum. And this was during the period when they did lobotomies for problematic patients. So imagine yourself one day you, you're, you go out to the bar for your birthday and you got a crush and you buy a drink for that crush. And the next thing you know, the police are busting down the door and a week later you're locked for the rest of your life in an insane asylum where you're treated as regardless of how salient you are, completely insane shocking unsettling right yeah but let's continue so we're now in the 60s and the 60s was a big time we had the civil rights movement we had a whole lot of civil rights uprisings of various types a lot of them racial of course, we all know this. Um, but I want to focus on a specific date near the end of the 60s. June 28th. Ah, we're getting there soon, aren't we? June 28th, 1969. And once again, the story brings us back around to the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village in the neighborhood of Manhattan in New York City. Yeah. Now, it's interesting once again, this was uh, the Stonewall Inn had been a, a, a secret speakeasy back in the 1930s. And then it had become a very, very quiet, clean, casual, heterosexual, not queer, not degenerate restaurant for some time. Until uh, about 1964. In 1964, uh, for an unknown reason, there was a fire 
inside of the Stonewall Inn, and the Stonewall Inn closed um, because, obviously, the interior had been burned. And at this point, three mafia investors said, hey, wait a minute. What if we buy this toasted inn and we kind of do a thing like we did back in the 30s? Remember back in the Prohibition? They're like, what if we turned it into a gay bar? And then all the gay people would come and we could sell them shitty watered down beverages. And they did it. They bought it. They re they gutted out the inside, they rebuilt the inside of the inn, and they reopened it as a gay bar. Not officially. It was it was a, a bar and restaurant, but they set out to everybody tell each other, hey, this is a gay bar. If you come here, we won't call the cops on you for being gay as long as you pay and as long as you buy alcohol while you're here. And they did water down the alcohol. They were actually like, like that was record. They watered it down like crazy. And they made fuckloads of money, by the way. Like they were making a lot of money such that so much money was the mafia making off of this bar that they were willing to not, not only did they um, get informants in the police, but they were actively bribing the NYPD uh, to, to prevent raids or give them forewarning of raids. And I wanna show you something that was common at the time. This one was a sign that was actually at the Stonewall Inn. I wanna show you this. This is super, super interesting. Are you ready? I'm gonna just show you this. Here, let's zoom, the, zoom this in. Take a look at this. Did it work? Hold on. Small technical issue. There we go. This is a raided premises. Police Department, City of New York, Howard R. Lear, Police Commissioner. This was a sign that originally hung at Stonewall. And this was put up by the owners of the bar to let people know that they would get raided. It is inevitable. If you are here, this would get raided. Basically, come here at your own risk. That was what was what was posted. Um... And, uh, of course, there was a lot of, it, this was not like a, this was not an act of charity by the mafia. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with it. I'll have to fix that. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Thank you, Samoski. I apologize about that. I'll try to avoid making it small for now, and we'll try and fix it afterwards. Um, but yes, uh, it was, uh, this was not done out of charity by the mafia. Um, it was more out of, you know, uh, opportunistic uh, shared interest. Gay people wanted a place to be safe. Mafia people wanted to make money. Um, so Stonewall was started because of rainbow capitalism? Kind of. A little bit. Keep in mind that, um, that you know, of course, in addition to overpriced, watered-down alcohol, the clientele was regularly propositioned by the owners for protection money. Hey, uh, we don't, we, it'd be a shame if the police came here more frequently. You better, uh, better toss us some bu some bucks, or else you never know what might happen. We might not be able to warn you when the cops came. And it got even worse. They would blackmail wealthy and well-known homosexual clients. So gay, if you showed up, if you were a politician or a business person or, or a socialite or whatever, or a newspaper person or anything, any sort of public figure, the mob would get your name and they would blackmail you. So you could go and meet other gay people, but the risk was you could get raided and if the if you didn't pay the mob and you pissed off the mob, they could out you. Yikes. So yeah. But despite all of that, the Stonewall Inn uh was one of a very few havens from public judgment that queer new yorkers were able to attend i mean this these were not common at the time there were gay bars but none of them were as safe or as popular and as guaranteed to find other gay people as uh as as the stonewall inn and um something i i, I want people to think about if you're not gay i want you to imagine 
yourself in the position of people like that what if the the shoe was on the other foot and you could only find people like girls if you're a guy guys if you're a girl a straight girl um you could only find them at a specific bar in one specific neighborhood in your entire city of millions of people how desperate would you be to get to that bar? And there's no dating apps. There's no dating services or anything like that. You want to meet somebody? You want to meet somebody to get in a relationship with? To get some fucking, fucking pussy? You got to go to this bar. That's the only place you can go to. Yeah. I imagine you can imagine how hard that would be for people. And also how much people would be willing to pay to do that. It's like... It's, it's like everything, but there's more too. Because Stonewall, not only was it on, one of the only gay bars in the city, it was one of the only gay bars in the city that had a dance floor that also allowed for slow dancing. So in most of the gay bars, they either didn't have a dance floor at all, so it was just sitting space and not really much, you know, it was hanging out as opposed to dancing and, 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 and being together with each other in that way. But, but also... They would not, even though they were a gay bar, they wouldn't allow you to do slow dancing because they didn't want to get in trouble for it. So if you wanted to be able to dance to lovely romantic music with your partner, you had to go to Stonewall. You had to get to Stonewall. Which makes it a pretty major spot, yeah? And the cops knew that. So for a long time, the mob was paying off the cops, like literally weekly. Every single week, the police would arrive and the mafia owners would fork over a stack of cash directly into the hands of the cops. And if they didn't, they would be shut down permanently. They would have everything confiscated. They would, uh, you know, the cops would be like, oh, you're selling watered down alcohol? Shame. Looks like you're all going to prison. Oh, you're allowing homosexuality to fo fo foster on your premises? Looks like you're going to prison. <laughs> Gayola. Exactly. There you go. Um, and, and it was, again, the, the raids still happened even when they were being paid. So they would raid, but they would just do it a little bit less frequently. They would raid, but they would do it, uh, in the evening before things got full into swing. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, it was so common. Raids were so common at the time that uh, it had become regular, like normal, for the raids to occur early in the evening. The police would come. Everybody would pretend that they were hanging out and eating food and, and, and just having their wine and whatever. Um, and then they, the police would come in and arrest anybody who was being particularly stupid. And then they would leave. And then everything would go back to normal. But something happened leading up to June 28th, 1969. And that was that the mafia got tired of paying the cops. They got really tired of paying the cops because they'd been paying a lot of money to the cops. And they said, this is fucked. This is fucked. And so they didn't pay. And on June 28th, 1969, at 1.20 a.m., that's no evening raid. The police arrived. A squad of police officers met up with four undercover police officers who had been hiding in Stonewall as spies, literally undercover cops hanging out in Stonewall, disguised as gay people. And they raided Stonewall. But there were some problems. You see, they didn't really have a plan, a great plan going into it. There was a lot of illegal alcohol on the premises. There were a lot of people on the premises. And as it turns out, their raid, they didn't really have enough people to get everything. And while they were trying to, while they were trying to make arrests and they were trying to uh, haul out all of the alcohol, um, because, again, um, 
Oh, that's certainly possible. I mean, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of details that might be slightly different, but none of these are for sure. They made a scene. See, as all this was happening, people started to gather because people were like, "What the hell's going on? Why is Stonewall getting raided at 1:30 in the morning? Normally, Stonewall gets raided in the evening. Why are they arresting all these people?" You're supposed to, you know, you cops are, we, you know, we pay our protection money and you're, you people are supposed to stay away. And then more people showed up and more people and more people showed up. And there were so many people showing up that the cops got scared. The cops got scared and they locked themselves into the bar with a bunch of the patrons. And... While they were standing there, they finally worked up their courage, apparently, and they tried to arrest a woman who was most likely, and there's there's some, uh, you know, there's some of this has been lost to history, but uh, most people seem to agree that the person they tried to arrest was Stormy Delarvier, or Delarvery, sorry, Stormy Delarvery, um, who resisted. Um... She did not believe that she was being rightfully arrested. She did not want to be thrown into the car. And she was treated brutally by the police. In fact, when the police, uh, in fact, like people were so frustrated by how um, harsh uh, they were being uh, to Stormy. Um, it is, it is, there are, there are reports that random citizens who are out watching this thing happen, formed a human wall by literally interlocking their arms over the door of the bar, which the police had to fight through in order to then throw Stormy into the back of the paddy wagon. And when they did that, when they did that, according to the police, the crowd went berserk. Fists were thrown, rocks were thrown, bottles were thrown, uh, billy clubs were broken out. Numerous members of the of the crowd were beaten by the police. Numer the police were pelted and bombarded and hit and bricks were thrown at the cops. And keep in mind, this was the population of a neighborhood saying that they've had enough. That they don't think this was right that these people were being persecuted and arrested. They, all of the patrons of this bar had done their part. They were just trying to live their lives. And a massive brawl broke out. And this is what we generally refer to as the Stonewall Rebellion, also known as the Stonewall Riot, sometimes colloquially just referred to as Stonewall. Of course, Stonewall was the bar but some people refer to the rebellion as Stonewall. And the rebellion did not actually go on for all that long. The, the, the riot, as it was declared by the police, um, well, we'll talk about that. Um, yes, because there was another person there who I want to talk about, uh, Marsha P. Johnson. Some of you may already know about Marsha P. Johnson. Um, some people have credited Marsha P. Johnson with being the first person to throw a brick at Pride. The person who started Pride is, I mean, Marsha P. Johnson is, is often credited with starting Pride. Now, that's not, uh, there is some question to that. Marsha, in Marsha's own words, um, you know, uh, Marsha P. Johnson claimed that, um, that they didn't throw any bricks ever, um, they were involved for sure. They were involved in the brawl, but they said they never threw a brick um, or anything like that. Um, and that when when Marsha arrived, because keep in mind, Marsha P. Johnson was a, a self-identified drag queen, a, a, a local activist who uh, was was super involved with the local gay community, was super, super like like Marsha P. Johnson was like like really involved. Like we're talking like a champion. You know what I mean? Like, Marsha was fighting constantly for gay rights in America in a time when this is what was going on. Um, you know, Marsha was well-recognized, uh, was was sort of seen as, like, a, a pillar of the community. And according, according to Marsha, when they arrived, 
and I'm using they because um, there is some uh, indiscrepancy about what pronouns and whatever Marsha P. Johnson liked to use, and it's not really important, so I'm just going to use they for now. Um, Marsha uh, claimed that when they arrived, there was already fighting happening. So whether Marsha threw the first brick or not, regardless, Marsha's arrival was seen as a major moment in this because of course Marsha was had been fighting all this whole time and also um um and also uh, there uh, well we'll get into that anyway so Marsha's arrival was sort of seen as a a major point of this and um as when Mar when Marsha had arrived the 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 fights had already begun the police were were bashing people the the uh the queers were bashing back so to say um and uh, and a number of people had already been uh, handcuffed and arrested and thrown into the paddy wagon. Um, and then it got worse, okay? Because as things went on and as things raged onward, the NYPD got really mad, as they are wont to do. And they called in the NYPD tactical police, which we would understand nowadays to be the SWAT team. Heavily armed heavily armored, um, you know, special unit of police designed to put down riots, riot police. We're talking the real thugs. Yeah, the bad motherfuckers and not in the fun way. And that was when it really went hog wild. When they arrived, it it spread out beyond the area. There wasn't just fighting and 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 windows being smashed in the area of the bar. It spread out all across the village. Um, Silent says, Everything I found suggested that the first act of resistance was more likely from the homeless young gay men who slept in a nearby park uh, and would try to get into Stonewall but couldn't always. Yes, there were a lot of bystanders. Uh, everything that I've seen also indicates that there were a lot of bystanders who were there long before uh, Marsha P. Johnson arrived. Um, but the reason why Marsha's presence is important is because of Marsha's involvement in activism d before, during, and after Stonewall. Marsha was a uh, was a well-known person who was actually able to get the eyes of the general populace onto this event. And that's really important. So yeah, that's why there's a lot of, there's a lot of attention given to that. And of course there is some, there is some, uh, you know, history can sometimes become obfuscated when there's crowds involved. We look for somebody that we can latch onto as an individual. Um, but yes, uh, Marsha was one of the first three drag queens allowed in Stonewall. Correct. Yep. That's correct. Um, that's yep. Yep, thank you. You you were the one who taught me that. I didn't know that, but that's super super cool. Um and uh and again, um the uh the riot had already started within like 30 minutes of this raid occurring. But it got really bad when the tactical police came in. When the tactical police arrived, of course there was a, a mass beatings that were um that 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 came out. Uh there was you know, weaponry used. There was people were destroying things at this point. There was a, a a proper riot had been declared, and the police decided to burn down the Stonewall Inn. Yeah, that's right. And in the words of the police, it was to smoke out the rioters, and they did. They burnt it. And it didn't reopen until way, way later. It, that just ended it. When they burnt the sm the, the stone wall uh, in down, that was the end of that particular center of queer life. Because the cops decided that they had the right to burn it down. Yes, the police burnt it down. Yes, they did. Were there people inside? Yes, there was. There were people inside when they set the building on fire. Is it clear who started the fire? Ev now, fires are like this, but every source I can find, every single source I found stated that due to statements by the police, because they said they wanted to smoke out the rioters, there is reason to believe that it was the police who started the fire. 
by all accounts I've seen. And, um, of course, uh, after that happened, the riot was sort of dissipated. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but so by 4 a.m., the riot had been dissipated, but that wasn't the end of the rebellion because over the following nights, there were numerous demonstrations, numerous. And in fact, after Stonewall, demonstrations by queer people whose, whose spaces had been systematically destroyed by the U.S. government, by the state government, began to demonstrate. And this is why we generally look at Stonewall as the start of Pride, as the first Pride event. It was a massive uprising that sparked a whole bunch of other ones. There were riots all over the country following Stonewall, and there were riots all over the village, all over Greenwich Village in New York, in Manhattan, in the following nights, which people like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were involved in. Many, many, many people of the time. Yeah, and of course, some of the later, some of the other, um, the other nights were actually more deadly than the initial one. But the initial one was what sparked it all. And these, is this is where we got Pride Month from. Pride Month is June because on the 28th, this event happened. And... For the rest of June, there were gay riots all over the village. And I want to read you something that I found. This is so absurd. But I want, you to, I, want, I want to read you something that was written about it at the time by a journalist, okay? Yeah, maybe we'll watch that. That sounds really interesting. Let me read you this. So, uh, does anybody know who uh, Judy Garland is? Uh, Judy Garland? <laughs> Judy Garland was a very famous actress who was in um, who was in uh, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, very, very famous. Um, yeah, Dorothy. Yeah, exactly. Now, Judy Garland died shortly before um, the event and many many people in the country considered judy garland to be a bit of a gay icon you know uh and and uh and for for some good reason and others but of course the straight people being um fucking totally judgmental and horrible they <laughs> i'm gonna read you something and this will mean that we'll have to take the twitch vod down but that's okay just listen to this, okay? New the news the village uh, uh, the village newspaper reported that the death of of Judy Garland, which which coincided with a full moon, had provoked the queer people of Greenwich Village into a great faggot rebellion. That was what was written about Stonewall at the time. That the gays went crazy because Judy Garland died. That's what they thought. And of course, this flies in the face of what everybody who was there said. Yeah, maybe we'll watch that right afterwards. That sounds really cool. There we go. Here, I'll put this in here. <laughs> I wish I was kidding, but that's what, <laughs> that's what was, that's what was said. And of course, there's, you know, the, 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 the actual people on the ground obviously said, what the fuck? Like, we don't care. Like, yeah, friend of Dorothy was sl slang for being gay. Of course. Yep. Yeah, I know. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'd say it more frequently. I'd say it 10 more times. But I mean, come on. I mean, does this not, like, remind you of, like, the way that, gay, that trans people are talked about right now? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's what I said. 
Time Magazine, in reviewing Garland's 1967 Palace Theater engagement, disparagingly noticed that a disproportionate part of her nightly clack, a clack seems to be homosexual. Goes on to say the boys in the light trousers, a time a phrase time repeatedly used to describe gay men. Oh my god. Yep. No, it's 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 laughable. That was what con that's what a conservative paper wrote about this at the time. The queer werewolf, uh, striped, striped kidder says that the queer werewolf set sentiment feels like it beautifully translates into the idea that a lot of queer people love Disney villains, demonic imagery, and magic because of the associations with being monsters. Yes, of course. Absolutely, of course. Who all's a boy in light trousers here? Mm -hmm. Did I say light or tight? Tight trousers, sorry, tight trousers, my bad. Not light trousers, tight trousers, my bad. But yes, there is, um, I, we'll talk about this a little more once I'm out of the main segment um, about the, the, the monster thing. But um, I wanted to wrap up this little segment. Now you know, now you know the story of Stonewall. You know what happened. The gay people were trying to live their lives, were getting constantly raided, and because of some conflict that had nothing to do with the gay people themselves, absolutely nothing, the police just decided to fuck them all up, set a building on fire while they were still in it, arrest a whole bunch of people, beat them. And at the time, the queer people who fought back, because they were fighting back against the police, were framed as evil. Yes, Jessica Metal, this is why people say no cops at Pride. This is why people say no cops at Pride. Which, regardless of where you stand on that particular issue, I hope that this story will help you understand why people say that. It is seen as the ultimate uh, co-option of the pride movement, a movement that started because of police raids, because of police raids that were so brutal and so common that they would have a, a sign, a courtesy sign. This premises is constantly raided. You might be arrested for being gay. No, that was real. Canadian brunch, that was real. That was actually published. I'm not kidding you, Canadian brunch. That phrase was actually used. Well, thank you, Android Covenant. I appreciate that. And and again, I understand that there are people who fall all on all different positions on all kinds of matters related to pride. But I think you should be able to understand why there are some of us who say that cops don't belong at pride because the cops were the reason we needed pride. The cops, the state, the state constantly banning and 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 criminalizing our existence the existence of trans people the existence of queer people the existence of 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 gay people in general that 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 criminalization has per, per, has been going on for centuries and it has been ruining the lives of people and i think it also might might help people understand why a lot of people um, I'll adhere to the born this way idea, even though I don't generally argue that position, you can understand why people appeal to it, right? Because, Hey, we can't help this. I argue one step further that we should not criminalize harmless activities, that we should not subject people to horrific treatment, to imprisonment, to beatings, just because we're it's not normal just because it's not so-called natural not because uh, just because it's it's different than the norm but the but you can see why people used it like that why they were so desperate to please let it stop please 
Judy Garland performed at gay bars in the 1950s, long before it was fashionable. Fashionable? Yep, correct. That is correct. I wish I was taught this in school. Me too. I really wish I was too. But I wasn't.